I know Aaron Judge ain't playing, and can you blame him? 62 is in the books. It finally happened. Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> Phone number to join 877-337-6666. Good afternoon, Evan. How are you today, were, bud? Were you disappointed he did it? Well, I would have rather he do it today, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but to me, it was either do it today or don't do it at all. You know what I mean? Uh, and some of that's selfish. I wanted this game to mean something. <laughs> so, you know, we have people listening to the radio station after 3.30, which is now <laughs> absolutely in doubt. But uh, listen, it's, you know, here's what's funny, me, Evan. You know, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment. No one should take anything away from what he's done because it's not been done a lot. Whether you steroids, non-steroids, to me it doesn't matter. I think, what, only five guys now, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a short list. Yeah, it's Sosa, a short Sosa, McGuire, list. Bonds, Ruth, Maris, now Judge. Yeah, so he's sixth. Okay, great. So he, whether you want to look at steroids, don't look at steroids, I don't care. It's still very, very hard to do what he's done. And because we celebrate, as we should, great individual performances and performers, you know, it's well, a huge story, and, you know, congratulations well, to him. What, but what he did, I think that added to it, maybe it's only something you and I and New Yorkers will appreciate, I don't think they're going to appreciate it outside of New York, is that he did it for a team that needed every ounce of it. Yeah. He was their yeah. best player. They needed every part of it to win the American League East, and not to knock down what Bonds did or McGuire did, they didn't make the playoffs their years. You know what I mean? Like, sure. They needed, the Yankees needed not just the power of Aaron Judge, but the all-around nature of Aaron Judge to have the regular season success that they had, which to me makes it even more impressive. Yeah, I, I, it was I important he did what he did. I guess there's two things to go over it. Number one, let's start with Aaron because that's the positive, right? If without Aaron Judge's career season and one of the great seasons in the history of the sport, not only do the Yankees most likely not win the division, you could make the argument the New York Yankees aren't even a wild card team. Now, I know that's debatable, but you get where I'm going with it. So yeah. when you add that to the mix, I think the season uh, takes on even more kind of Paul Bunyan-esque yes. type of uh, you know lifestyle, well, and, right? And you know what else? Here's the other thing. Uh, unlike Bonds and McGuire, who at that point in their careers had become one-dimensional players, Aaron Judge has had a gold glove year defensively, whether it's in center field or right field. Yeah. Plus, he's had a great offensive season besides just hitting home runs. So it was more than just the home runs he hit, which made yeah, this season incredible. He, you can't, listen, he has the most complete season you know, players have had in the history of the game when you consider, like you're saying, batting average, runs, RBIs, the gold glove uh, outfield. By the way, to his credit, showing you that the record did mean something to him, he has played every day. In yep. a sport where guys like him don't play every day, you know, the Cal Ripken days, the days of guys playing a buck, you know, 60, 61, 62 are dead and gone for a lot of reasons. And yet uh, 20 consecutive days, that guy showed up and yep. played baseball. So yep. I, I just, you, you know, you just applaud it. The thing that is bothering me about it today is this lazy, easy cop-out narrative that I don't blame Roger Maris Jr. for having because it's about his dad. He's not paid to have an opinion on TV or on the radio about, you know, the home run chase or any of that stuff. He's there representing his family. So I put Roger Maris Jr. aside. He's a fan. He's a guy. He's not a commentator. He can believe whatever the heck he wants to believe. Right. It's right. all good by me. But there's a lazy, easy kind of cop-out narrative, and I'm not sure why people do it, but it's somewhat bothersome to me that baseball is now, for whatever reason, the only sport on the planet where some people, not everybody, of course, wants to discount achievements based on whether or not guys were using HGH or, or steroids and take them out of the record books. Listen, I'm sorry. It existed... Guys were doing steroids. You can make the argument somehow, some have, that there was a period of time where baseball liked the fact that guys were oh, doing things like that, right? They loved it. Right. Loved it. They promoted it. They are happy about it. They didn't take it out of the game until they were kind of, you know, forced to for whatever reason. 73 is a real number, guys. 
And to come out on the radio, on TV, in the newspaper and suggest something that, to his credit, even Aaron Judge has never suggested and is not taking ownership of, the record is Barry Bonds's. The number is 73. And don't get that twisted. But isn't it okay to feel something different about this number? From what standpoint? From here, from this standpoint, you're right. The record is 73. I agree with you, okay? But there is something special about a human being hitting 62 home runs without being aided by steroids. 100%, yes. And, that, and this is my point is that if I acknowledge that Bonds has the record, I don't think that diminishes what Aaron Judge did. And I think the problem for me is that I think that's what people think. And I can't put myself in people's brains, obviously, but the only reason to come out and try to throw what Bonds did and put in the garbage can is because you think in some way, shape, or form, it minimizes what Aaron did, and it doesn't. But, But, Craig, I think that the term American League record has been code language for a month. Yes. It's a code language. No one truly cares about the American League record. But a broadcaster or a headline can't say the real record, the clean record. Sure. So we've been using this term, which is factually accurate. It's the American League record. It's the Yankee record as a way to say this is historic when the truth is it's not the record. Right. But we don't want to say it's the non-tainted record. So we hide behind It's the American League record. Yeah, now listen, the fact that he's a Yankee, of course, plays into it. All that stuff, all the history and lore of Babe Ruth, Roger Maris, you know, and then blank, and the blank happens to be, in this case, you know, for the Yankees, obviously, Aaron Judge. It's it's, it's one of my biggest pet peeves in sports that we got to find some way to break people down or, you know, criticize people or, you know, change history based on, you know, what suits us. And I've been guilty of, you know, you and I have had the conversation on this show when I bring up the fact that, you know, no fault of their own. Guys in different eras, you know, played or didn't play rather against uh, African American ball players or Latin American right. ball players. Not their fault, but listen, obviously numbers would be different if they had, for obvious reasons, they were great players in those eras. They didn't get to play. There's a live ball era, a dead blah, 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 blah. Barry Bonds has the record for most home runs in a season. Aaron Judge had one of the greatest, if not the greatest seasons any of us has ever seen. So embrace it for what it is and don't try to make it what it's not. That's it's all. Ele- it's 11 short of the major league record. That's the fact. It's yeah. 11 home runs short of the guy with the most home runs in a single season. Yeah. Now, the game last night, and I'm glad he did it early because I got to go to bed afterwards. Uh, um, so did Aaron Judge. Yes. <laughs> very true, very true. Uh, of course, uh, it's going to be judged by, well, were the calls any good? Now, I'm in a weird spot on that one because you know, if I take a shot at the TV call, people think I'm just taking a shot you know, because we compete again. Well, that's not really a competition. Uh, let me rephrase <laughs> that. Um, because we uh, you know, do the same job against one another uh, on the radio. That being said... You got to give old man John Sterling credit because it didn't sound like it was written or prepared or scripted. It might have been, but it didn't come across that way. He referenced historical things that have happened in the 120 years of baseball, whatever his number was, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought John Sterling, for as much as we make fun of John Sterling for getting calls wrong, take a listen to last night because it's good. Here's the 1-1. One, one. Swung on. There it goes. Deep left. It is high. It is far. It is gone. Number 62 to set the new American League record. Aaron Judge hits his 62nd. All the Yankees out of the dugout to greet him. Just think of it. Three Yankee right fielders. The Babe hitting 60 and 27. The Jolly Roger hitting 61 and 61. And now Aaron Judge hits his 62nd home run, the most home runs any American leaguer has hit in a single season. And the American League has been alive for 120 years. This is Judgment Day. Case closed. 
I mean, it's great, right? About 50 seconds uninterrupted, oh. uh, seemed unscripted. On the TV side, uh, they uh, stole John's call of case closed uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well. That seemed very scripted, unfortunately. So to me, uh, I don't even know if I should play it. Do you want me to even play it? I, I want d- you to play. I want you to I'll play be it fair because if you want. I have I have a critique, and I'm curious if you are thinking of the same thing that I had. All uh, right, here's uh, the yes call uh, uh, with the gang uh, from yesterday as well. Play it. High fly ball, deep left. There it goes. Sailing into history. He's done it. He has done it. Sixty-two. Aaron Judge is the American. No, John said case closed. <laughs> Is that, was there like some kind of agreement we're all going to say case closed? What's your critique? I don't know if you agree with me on this. So yeah. I, I listened to this five different times. Case and I'm, closed. It sounded as if off the bat, he forgot Aaron Judge was going for 62. Huh. And it was almost like this shock and like, oh, reminder, it's gone. Like I, there was that pause that made me think. I forgot. Wait a second. Is this something special? Yeah. And then it hit him. I better, I better do some talking because it's all about me. It's not about the moment anymore. I better get myself out there because people are going to be playing this for the rest of their lifetimes, right? Yeah. Anyway, those are the calls. Uh, it was great last night. Uh, again, uh, individual accomplishment. But as, as Evan said, you're talking about one of the great individual years in the history of baseball. And it mattered for his team where, you know, all those great years, to be fair, that Mike Trout has had for the Angels, it hasn't mattered. Right. And he's had some of the great years on record in the history of baseball, and yet they've got the longest drought uh, as of not making the playoffs. It, it adds to what you did that you're doing it in big moments, and you're doing it contributing to a winner. I know it's not all Mike Trout's fault. I'm not blaming him. But I think it adds to your season when you were in a pennant race for, for a part of the year. I know they ran away with it over the last few weeks. But here's the cold reality for Aaron Judge, and we all know this. We have been celebrating this man for really all season long, specifically the last month. If Aaron Judge goes up against the Tampa Bay Rays or the Cleveland baseball team and goes 0 for 12 with six strikeouts and has a bad couple of weeks... Most Yankee fans are going to forget everything that happened in this regular season. Look at us as Met fans. Sure. Pete Alonso, Francisco Lindor had great years. They had three rough, meek days against Atlanta, and we were all taking turns killing both of those guys. Yep. The postseason is how you're defined. And if Aaron Judge comes up small in October, that's what Yankee fans are going to remember. Meanwhile, a hedge front guy catches the ball, Corey Humans. And uh, interestingly enough, there was a guy, as you're looking at the TV, to our left on the TV screen, to his right, sitting in the stand. So I thought, pulled off one of the brightest maneuvers ever for a guy that wants to catch a ball that's going to be worth anywhere from 2 to $4 million. He thought the ball might be short, and it was close. So he jumped down off the ledge on purpose, <laughs> thinking that if the ball is short, or if the guy pulls a lasagna and drops the ball... He's going to get the ball. Brilliant. So he jumps down, but humans makes the catch. How about the fact, there's so many things about this. Number one, I agree with you, Craig. I thought the idea of this man saying, and he must have pre-planned this, if it's close, I'm jumping. I'm taking a shot. I got a chance to get it if someone drops it, if it doesn't make it. But the thing that surprised me is this humans guy brings his glove. Good for him. That's fine. I know you're against that. He makes the clean catch. And it was uninhibited. Like, no one was really... There wasn't a lot of, like, him. elbowing out. Here no. it comes. Here it comes. You're right. You're right. There was a Yankee fan next to him that wanted to take a selfie with him. Yeah, it was like, pretty was, clean. You're right. Yeah, it was the cleanest $2 million home run ball catch you could ever imagine. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, good for him. They're saying if since Judge is not playing today, he's not going to hit 63 or beyond. So the ball, and maybe we'll talk to Brandon Stein here in a little bit, is worth uh, upwards of... Four million dollars. Wow. He's already had an offer. An official offer has already come in for two million dollars, hmm. which fascinates me. <laughs> two million bucks, and they're saying it might be worth as much as four million dollars. So there you go. Uh, sad to say, meaningless baseball game today. The Yankees didn't take the week off. The Mets uh, start the Friday, of course, and uh, their games are all at nighttime. So you'll get 7.30 or 8 o'clock Friday night, Saturday night. If they play on Sunday, 
As of right now, that's a 737 start, and that could change a little bit based on another series going uh, the distance. So you got what you wanted. You don't have to have a viewing party on the air. We get to do <laughs> our show and lead right in to Met Baseball on Friday night. I know you're ecstatic. And yeah. Just for people to know, I just want to give people a little background here, right? So I, I, I do this other thing in the morning, whatever. I'm done at 930. 935, I didn't see it because I don't have my phone with me at the moment. I got a message from Evan. He called me at 935. So I call him back maybe at 10 o'clock this morning. Yes. What's up? Because Evan and I do not talk a lot on the phone, really ever, in the two years we've been together, <laughs> right? to be honest. So Evan said, he goes, you got to do me a favor. you got to find out when are we playing on, specifically Friday. When is Friday's game? I keep refreshing Twitter. Nobody's announcing it. MLB isn't saying anything. Do me a favor. Find out when the game is. So I go, all right, it seems really important to you. Yes. I'll call you back in five minutes. I make a phone call. I get the answer. We're going to play at 7.30 on Friday, 8 o'clock on Saturday. There's a chance that those times will change about a half hour, meaning Saturday would be 7.30. Friday would go back, but essentially 7.30, 8 o'clock, okay? I call Evan back. He doesn't answer the phone. <laughs> He's panicked for an answer. I get a form in five minutes. He doesn't answer the phone. How quickly did I call you back, though, when About I saw? Maybe 60 seconds, two minutes. 60 otherwise. seconds later, and when Craig uttered the words to me, I've got good news. First, I thought he was effing with me because I, I think you're that kind of guy. But then you weren't. You said, you got your wish, it's a night game. And I was so freaking ecstatic. Yes. Because it would pain me to my core to not be able to be at a Met home playoff game. And I'll be in the building Friday. And fellow Met fans, I don't know if you've turned the page yet. Last night was rough. We got teased a little bit. A little bit of a tease last night. I got the Brave Marlin game on while yeah. I'm at City Field with my son sleeping on my lap during a doubleheader. I wouldn't leave until the outcome of the Brave game. And I'm staring at my tablet watching this game. And when the Braves get the final out, because all of a sudden Kenley Jansen's Mariano Rivera again, I was upset. I was upset for about an hour. Because it ended, right, it ended the hope. Sure, It was all dead. And then I started talking myself up, saying, you know what? I know this sucks. I know this was disappointing. But on Friday night, we begin anew. So I am ready, as a Met fan, to move on from the disaster of the weekend and say, hey, let's freaking go. We got three games in our own damn building. Let's go. Uh, no excuses. You could erase this weekend if you come out against San Diego, beat them two straight, and we move on. Let's go. Well, just like you said about Aaron Judge and the Yankees. If the Yankees or Aaron Judge specifically, you know, spits the bit in whatever their first series is, whoever it's against, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna forget about this magical season. And if the New York Mets come out, even if it takes three games and they care. beat San Diego, you're going to forget about the sweep against the Braves 100%. And I would tell everybody, be careful, okay? The Atlanta Braves have done a lot of chirping over the last few days. you got two-bit relievers doing chirping. you got former guys doing chirping. I will just say this to my friends in Atlanta. You beat the Mets this weekend. You took our soul for now. For now. And I would be very, very careful about what may or may not happen in a couple of weeks. You didn't kill them. You put them down for a little bit. But you didn't kill him. You didn't finish the job. I'd be very careful. That's Big, all I'll say. Uh, there's one question about today's Met game. Let me just give you the answer because it's out there already. Uh, Jeff McNeil, who's going for a batting title, and I think he's uh, up by four percentage points right now, if I have that right, in the battle. Uh, the question was, is he going to play or not? And Buck Walter did not put him in the Met lineup tonight to protect the lead and give him a chance to win a batting title. And Buck made it very clear McNeil wanted to play. I made the decision well, to keep him out. Now, in fairness, I, I got no we, problem with that. We, we could all. There's a lot of avenues to this. Number one, this was the first game this season that you knew was meaningless. All right. Yeah. So Francisco Alvarez is catching. For example, Francisco Alvarez is not going to catch a real game that matters. He caught the last few innings of yesterday's game once the Braves won. Pete Alonso is not in the lineup. So this also could be Buck Showalter saying, "Hey." I got to give my regulars one last break before yeah. the games start to matter on so Friday. So two days off, not bad. Good. So yes, the batting title may be a factor as well. I'm not ignoring that. But you also have to remember, this is the first time, besides the last four innings of last night's game, where Buck can legitimately give his key guys an off day. And I think that's a factor too. 
All right, well, listen, we got lots to do. We'll get your calls throughout the afternoon. We're going to take you right up into Yankee pregame today, which is at 3.30. Uh, also, no Susan on the radio yesterday for the John Sterling call. You know she's got to be upset about that. You had to hit the home run during Yum Kipper. <laughs> and not only that, you know, for many practicing Jews, you can't listen to the game or watch it either on the highest of holy days. Yeah. Not supposed to put the TV on or put the radio on. So I wonder how she found out. Oh, that would be terrible. I think John probably texted her. Yeah, but hey, she's Susan. not on her phone, right? Well, she'll get the message eventually. Can you imagine if she didn't know till like, in reality, you know, it starts at sundown. It goes to sundown. So there's a chance she still doesn't know. <laughs> wow. Think about that. Yeah. Let's say she's in her New York City apartment. Assuming she has one. I don't know where she lives. And she's observant, like, you know, orthodox style observant, right. right? Yep. Once you go to sundown last night, that's it. Oh, you know how she would know? Old school wise. Like, it's 1955. How? She had a newspaper thrown to her doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> and funny. she went outside and it says, Judge 62? What was, what was the headline? It was, was it uh, Bat Last or something like that? There For was something paper? like that. I don't know. I don't read the papers anymore. I wasted my, my time. Uh, let me see. The New York Post report. The, the New York Post front page just said sixty-two, where, and it had an exclamation point. That's all. Okay. What did the back say? The back page said, uh, "At blast." That, at blast. Yeah, the old Edith Judge James finally right. crushes historic number sixty-two. There you go. By the way, congratulations to Gary Cohn. If I have this right. He's a finalist for the Ford Frick Award? Yes, one of 10 broadcasters who are finalists for this award. Congratulations, Gary. Yeah, so, uh, and today, of course, will be his last game of the year because uh, after this, it all goes to Fox and ESPN and TNT, and he gets to do it like the rest of us and watch from home. 